Stanford University. So, um, I have uh, something prepared for you, which I don't usually do. Um, and we'll see how quickly I can bring us through that. And then uh, perhaps you'll ask me some things and, and we can turn it into a, a conversation uh, rather than a speech. Um, Andrew, if you could uh, turn the lights off and we could turn the video light off. Uh, uh, so uh, where I've been going uh, and why. Um, I was a traveler uh, well before I became a photographer. Uh, I could spend a long time looking at a map, uh, not in order to see how to go anywhere specific, uh, but to imagine the way a city that I'd never been to uh, climbed over its hills, or how its buildings wound back and forth al along the sea. Uh, I loved stations and the names of railways and airlines the livery of airplanes and to explore the far corners of a hotel that I'd never been in or to go prowling inside of a ship. And after that, to stand for a long time beside the railing on its deck. I still love all of these things. A list of the names of cities, uh, Dusseldorf, Udaipur, Kinshasa, uh, it had and it still has an automatic poetry to me, even if nothing is said about the cities themselves. Maps are seldom beautiful in the way that works of art are, but there have been many times when looking at a map has given me just as much pleasure as looking at a picture. So I was some kind of explorer of back alleys and railroad sidings, and such things, even before I was really old enough to go anywhere far from home. Um, it, as Hillary said, when I was still quite young, um, when I was nine years old, my parents took their children to live in Tokyo, um, legitimizing in their family what a traveler does, institutionalizing it actually, and making it one of the vital, uh, essential things for all of us. But going to live in Tokyo was not exceptional in itself. Uh, Japan was full of Americans in the early 60s, and I went to school with children who boasted about the fantastic places where they had lived, in Bangkok or Saigon or Kathmandu. Everyone but me, I, I had never left the United States until then, and, and everyone but me seemed to be on close terms with Hong Kong. Um, so if there was something unusual in the way that that early expatriation was presented to me, it was that my parents found a mission in it. Um, they said, mainly by their own example, that it wasn't enough having migrated to a new world merely to be there. Being there had to be used. Uh, and being there had to be used well. Um, it had to be made a means of knowing one's life and enlarging oneself with the knowledge and the feeling that one gained. And this was an absolute value, though I'm not sure that they ever explained why it was one. Um, the first weeks that we spent in Tokyo, we lived in a hotel uh, beside the western moat of the Imperial Palace, a, a place called the Chidori Gafuchi, which I learned much later has been called in poetic English, uh, the abyss of a thousand birds. Um, and uh, my parents immediately forbade me to walk more than a short way up the lane that looks onto the moat. Um, I was especially not to go out onto the big boulevard roaring with traffic at the end of the lane. Uh, but of course I went. Um, I didn't tell anyone, I just went. Um, there were marvelous, shuddering, almost antiquated trolleys running along that boulevard, and there was no chance that I'd resist them. Um, I went, I got onto one. I didn't know where it went, uh, except that it ran down the hill toward a shop full of plastic model ships that I'd seen a couple of days before. Um, but I didn't doubt that I'd know where to jump off, and I gave the conductor uh, one of the 100 yen notes that were everyone, everywhere in those days. Uh, they had a portrait on them of an exotic uh, 
double-bearded 19th century nobleman. Um, that 100 yen note, the, the famous Count's bizarrely pointed beards, uh, were almost as good as the trolley itself. So I often feel um, that the journey that I've made in my adult life began right then, um, leading forward through an unending uh, series of boulevards, paths, and alleys, uh, random yet mysteriously logical too, um, and that I've never tired of investigating them. Um, I actually wanted to call this show when we started working on it, uh, Boulevards and Alleys of the World City, but I was overruled. Uh, but, but it is what I had in mind. Um, now there was a moment, of course, years later when I began to photograph, and at that point photography and exploration began to wind together in my life, the way two vines wind together. Um, and so if I've traveled a good deal in order to photograph, I've also photographed in order to have a reason to travel, not just an excuse for it, but some way to structure and make useful each day of traveling. Uh, to make something more out of traveling than just wandering. So, explore, I said a moment ago. Um, but what was I exploring? Well, you know, from my earliest days, I remember these sorts of things, okay? You know, the hundred yen notes with the count and his beards, uh, of course, and the greasy black wooden floor of the trolley and the way the trolley groaned when the driver sped it up, and the petite leather bag and the hoary, long-nailed hands of the conductor, and the way the glass rattled in the windows as the trolley banged over the street, and the liquid enamel surface of the steel sheet with the root number that slid into a holder beside the headlight. And I remember the way the glass rattled in the windows in the winter everywhere in Japan, and the cold and the smell of kerosene in the burner when you entered a tiny warm room, and later dusty vacant spaces at the centers of mountain towns in the winter, and the fierce silver glare on the fronds at the tops of palm trees at noon in the tropics, and the sea in the sun, and the sea in fog, and the sea at night, and the awful millipedes that infested the rocks beside the sea. And why am I listing all this? I mean, all this was well before I thought of photographing. Uh, these are all memories from childhood, but not even memories, just isolated images from the past. But a direct line connects them and the work that I've done as an adult. Um, what was I exploring? Nothing important. And it seems to me that that itself is an important thing. You know, always the physical, always the trivial, the stuff in a shop window, something extremely elusive and barely describable in the face of someone I would never speak to, uh, much less know. Uh, to, uh, to speak of being an explorer makes it sound glamorous in a way that it certainly was not in my case. I've never been to war. I've traveled very little to places that will put your life or your health at risk. Uh, one year in Vietnam I was told that if you went a mile up a certain path you would come to a spectacular view of mountains and rivers, but that there were still some old landmines buried along the way and occasionally one of them went off and uh, you know the risk was very small that I said no thanks because I was never that kind of adventurer. Um, and I've seen, uh, I've seen very little of um, famous people. And where I have, they've rarely seemed larger to me than many people I knew who weren't famous. Um, I've seen few great events. I was present, as Hillary said, especially uh, for the destruction of the World Trade Center in 2001. But I had no desire to photograph anything uh, that day. Um, and later, when I did bring a book out of what had happened, uh, I gave much thought to how I might approach the subject of September 11th as obliquely as I could. Um, but there's nothing in any of the photographs in the book, Wounded Cities, to identify it. Um, I went to Cape Town at a moment soon after the collapse of the apartheid government there. And it was one of those times when a particular place seems to really stand on a, 
a crux of modern history the way New York would three years later when it was attacked. Um, and there was much to learn and to conjecture about what was happening in South Africa. Uh, you could talk late into the night with your friends about where the world was going. But the best photograph that I brought back from that trip was this one uh, of a boy at a ramshackle fruit stand where the subject uh, seems to have little to do with the epic violence of Africa or South Africa's remarkable escape from, escape from catastrophe just uh, a couple of years before. The photograph, to me, seems much more concerned with ugliness and beauty and how the things here, the oranges, the stand, the light, the boy, can be beautiful and ugly at the same time. Uh, and really how the beauty and the ugliness are, uh, are one, uh, how they're the same thing as each other. Um, the chaos, the order uh, that you find in these places, how they're intertwined with each other, how out of their intertwining certain very powerful feelings will mysteriously arise. Uh, longing, regret, exhilaration, revulsion. So it's been very common for me to go to a place uh, for the sake of its well-known beauties, uh, you know, for the, the golden stone and majestic architecture of the Louvre and the Rue de Rivoli, let's say, and end up someplace altogether different. Um, you know, on the north side of Paris, beside the, the peripherique, the, the highway there, on the way to the airport, among, you know, Soviet gray apartment blocks uh, at dusk and with these huge illuminated signs of great international companies. Um, I love what Diane Arbus said, uh, that she had never taken the picture she meant to take. They were always better or worse. Um, and uh, for me, it's been a given that you never knew what you were going to get, uh, that that, to be surprised, was a great part of the, the point. So that even if you went to Africa, you know, with the idea um, that uh, you would be looking for a certain kind of face or a certain sourness of expression that you thought you could expect to see, uh, it took you only a short way toward the photograph itself, uh, which was made of so many far more specific things. Um, the tightness of the braids of a particular woman and the speed of her glance and the exact quality of her suspicion and the thickness of her lips and the glare of the sun. I wanted to be led by the material world without knowing what it meant and to discover uh, what it meant, if it meant anything at all. Uh, through the photographing of it. I, I went to Veracruz uh, for the port, uh, but I have this. Um, I went to grand hotels uh, in Bangkok, in Bali, in Sharm el Sheikh, uh, expecting that I might see beautiful women in the luxurious <laughs> gardens there. But in this case, at least, it was a different kind of woman who I found, or perhaps uh, beautiful in some other way than the conventional one that I'd had in mind. And even when the woman beside the pool at the Grand Hotel was authentically, conventionally beautiful, uh, it wasn't necessarily her conventional beauty that made the subject of the picture. It was, in this case, her marvelous feet. But who can say what's marvelous about them, you know? Not, not only don't, do they not, but they don't ask for explanation. Uh, in fact, they resist it, but they're reason enough for the, the photograph. Um, so, I've been an investigator of extremely trivial things that would come to have uh, meanings of unexpected kinds and to be beautiful in unexpected ways. Uh, my mother, who was a traveler herself and a, a historian and a moralist, and who believed in the moral importance of reading history into everything that uh, she saw had no use for this. Um, if she went to Bombay, she wouldn't fail to learn in advance uh, the complicated mythology of the Elephanta Caves. And 
I told her at one point when I was in high school or, or college that for me the beauty of traveling was in the atmosphere of it, in the way that the world unrolled outside the train window or in the faces of the people one traveled among, uh, that it was in movement and weather and transience and loneliness, etc. But to her this was Philistinism, you know? Uh, and I must have sounded foolish, in fact, or at least dreamy in a very adolescent kind of way, because history does exist, however poorly understood it is, before someone makes a, a narrative out of it. Poetry doesn't exist at all until there's a poem. Um, so another way to say this is that when you make a, a, good, uh, uh, a good picture, uh, what you think you understand about your subject may be your starting place, but then the picture will open up from there and take you very far away from it. Um, for myself, I often feel that the, the best pictures I've made arrive with a kind of beauty uh, that's unrecognizable to me. Um, it's been a long time, but for example, when I did this one, which um, comes from a rather posh hotel, uh, in a chateau in the Loire Valley. Um, I think I was interested in the grandeur and the luxury of the place and when I first saw the photograph it meant nothing to me. Um, I thought it was a failure uh, and I only gradually began to trust it and I didn't know what to do with it and then eventually I realized that the luke's of this place was much less the point than the frozen quality of the people in the picture and the way that they seem to be unable to speak to each other and each one of them seems to be locked up in himself or herself. Um, and maybe in the end it's the incongruity of this and the generosity of the setting that makes the picture interesting. At any rate, with the best pictures you discover what they mean after you've made them. Um, after all, uh, a photograph uh, really tells you uh, so little of what you need to know about the world. Um, there's no sound in it, there's no motion, there's no before or after, there's no why something happened, even a lot of the time there's no what happened. Um, it tells you so little and yet at the same time uh, it inundates you with information about the surface of things. Um, so that I've come to feel that photographs are as much about what they don't say as they are about what they do say. Um, and in that gap uh, between uh, showing so much and explaining so little, uh, there arises uh, an ambiguity, a kind of ambiguity. And it's in working with that that uh, photographers make the pictures that I value the most. Um, so to me, um, Unknowing and uncertainty are uh, at the heart of what's beautiful in photography, uh, or at least in that area of photography where I've worked. I want every photograph to ask, who are you and what is this, and to be unable to answer, yet to be profuse in all the answers that it suggests. So, you know, maybe this is why we um, come up again and again against that awful, uh, frustrating situation in which you'll, uh, you'll see some artist standing before you on a stage or being interviewed um, and you'll say, we'll say, you know, what did you mean in this piece of work? What's your work about? Um, what are your intentions? And artists, of course, are usually terribly resistant to answering questions like that. Uh, you know, unless they're the kind who uh, like to make very grandiose and self-important claims for themselves. Um, if you take the resistance at face value, of course, the whole thing ends up sadly. The artist ends up looking inarticulate or rebellious or at worst, you know, stupid. Um, but whatever poses he strikes, what he's really trying to do is to protect the ambiguity of the thing that he made. Um, he's trying to leave the thing that he made open uh, to its multiple meanings to keep it from being packaged up neatly and put into a nice categorical box. If he, if he lets that happen, then all of its beauty will drain away. Um, it'll cease to be beautiful, it'll become trivial, and, and it'll die. 
Um, yet, at the same time, um, it seems to be built into all of us that we have to try to understand life in terms of stories. What happened and what happened next and why did they do that and what would I have done? You can't get through 10 minutes without framing life that way, chronologically and looking for causes and effects. Um, the need to turn life into story is almost inescapable. Um, but to me, the, the best photographs resist being put into a narrative frame. Um, what happened? They won't tell you. Uh, even when you have a very fine photographer who's willing to attach a well-known story to his work. Okay, I, I'm thinking right now of a, a man called Jim Goldberg, um, who will tell you that his recent work is about the migration of Africans and Eastern Europeans and Bengali workers uh, to Europe, into Europe. And even though those are the people in his pictures, though, uh, that story is not what his pictures are about. Uh, the story's there, but the photographs are about 10,000 obscure connections that you see in them between a glance and the way that the light shines through the trees and a scribble of handwriting and somewhere uh, in all of that, somewhere in all of that, the nominal story too. Uh, you know, perhaps it's not about about, uh, as they say. Um, If you're very deeply involved in the art of photography, you probably still can't help trying to understand the world in terms of, of stories as much as anyone else. Um, yet you can't really tolerate it either. And so perhaps um, when we're uh, faced with a good photograph, a kind of shuttling is set up in which you try to fit the world to what you understand, and then you try in reverse uh, to fit what you understand to the world. And that's what I appreciate when I look at a good photograph. Um, that, to me, is the starting point of, of what affects me. Um, so, you know, it's probably even necessary if you do a show like the one that's, that's here at Stanford, you know, to say, uh, that your show is about some well-known subject, that this show is about globalization, for example, whatever that is. Uh, but this can only be to, uh, to oversimplify. Um, uh, by the way, um, you know, this is one reason why, to me, the expression uh, documentary photography is so much of a fingernail on a blackboard um, <laughs> because it presumes that there is a stable phenomenon out there and that the photographer has a stable relationship to it. You know, that the thing has a, a certain meaning and the photographer is going to deliver that meaning to you when uh, in truth it's changing from minute to minute and the photographer probably doesn't know exactly what it is anyway. And if he did, and if that's what he showed you, uh, he wouldn't be a discoverer anymore at all. He'd, he'd have become an illustrator. Um, so sometimes I'm asked, why did you begin to photograph? And here, too, I have the most uncomfortable feeling about <coughs> answering the question, um, because it asks for a logic that isn't really there. Uh, you know, I'll answer faithfully and with good intentions. And I'll say, for example, that uh, you know, when I was nine years old and my parents moved their children to Tokyo, um, and I was suddenly placed in an unfamiliar world where being unable at first to speak the language, everything stood out vividly and mysteriously, and I had to live on seeing alone. And that going on that way in a sort of condition of arrested development, uh, I became a photographer who lives on seeing alone at, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. But this, of course, is uh, is far too simple. Uh, it's not false, um, but it's only part of the truth. I don't live on seeing alone, for one thing. Nobody does. But I was still drawn to this medium, um, in which the way I've come to love it, it's full of uncertainty and unknowing, and it chases forever after. 
uh, very unstable meanings and appears to pin the world down when in fact it hates to pin anything down. Plenty of the people I went to grade school and to high school with had a, a similar experience to mine as expatriates um, of being moved into a strange, barely comprehensible world. But they went on to do kinds of work in which one works to achieve ever more precise definition. They became lawyers, they became journalists, or they became doctors. Why did I come to work in this medium which takes pleasure and pride in the indefinite and the mysterious? And I really can't tell you. Um, the reason can only have to do with something very obscure and ele elemental in, uh, in me. Um, it really is a, a, a matter of, of gravity in some way. Um, so when I am photographing, um, I'm not thinking all that much uh, about the meanings of subjects. I'm thinking about where to stand and when to make the exposure and about what the light expresses and about how much chaos there is and how much order and how much intimacy and how much distance and how much that's grand and how much that's trivial and how much beauty there is and how much ugliness and how much is shapeless and how much is shaped. Um, and later when I'm studying the pictures I'll think about their meanings and I'll slowly come to understand what they might be. Um, and if the picture as a matter of fact isn't some kind of a discovery for me um, it won't bring anything new to anyone else. Um, so given all that, how is it possible to say that I know what I'm doing, that I'm not just <laughs> shooting in the dark, that it's not, you know, a matter of very dumb uh, luck? Um, it's worked for me to set the boundaries of each project I've worked on almost as broadly as I could. So I would say to myself, for example, I'm going to make a series of pictures in relation to what I thought of as the world city. Uh, in an age of fantastic promise, which was also an age that was full of unease. Uh, here is something that I, I wrote for a group show that I was in a, a year or so ago. Um, I, I wrote, uh, it often seemed to me as if I lived in a worldwide city, a vast lattice in which the cities of many countries were nodes tied to each other with invisible threads, air routes, satellite links, undersea cables, shareholdings, mechanisms of credit, supply chains, crazes, all the obscure innumerable bonds between individual people. Within that aggregation, it wasn't much harder to cross the world than to go from one side to another of any great metropolis. The world city is the place where you are when you cannot tell exactly where you are. It's the place where Buenos Aires and Dusseldorf and Hong Kong look more like each other than different. It's the place where Asia, Europe, Africa, and America continually reshape each other, each in its own image, and where people often tell me that they feel the freedom and exhilaration that they don't feel in the parochial backwater towns of their native countries. And because it's full of their aspirations and their longings, it's also a place where beauty and anxiety and sometimes even fear are all mixed up together. So I might go to Berlin then, as I did in 1995, uh, knowing that the sense of the world city was what I was after, and knowing that it was important that it was winter. And I might have had some attraction, too, at that time to the color gold. Uh, and I could have had no idea that I would find my way to a particular shop window at a certain hour of one day. And that's all there is here, a shop window laid on an icy day. Nor could I have had any idea that this picture would be any good. Yet I would have been powerfully aware of the large idea, the idea of the world city, and the brilliance and the exultation and freedom and risk and longing that seemed to me to characterize life in the world city as I'd known it. And I would have been confident that once all of the photographs I was making were strung together like a necklace of stones that you make, that you picked up on the beach, um, or the scraps in, that made up 
Helen Levitt's film, In the Next Room, um, that they would collectively become an utterance of the time in which I'd lived. Uh, and they would breathe in and out what seemed sharpest to me about living in it. And later, back in New York, I would discover that whatever I thought the window was when I was there, all of that radiance and all of that evanescence was the point. Um, and maybe even that they were what I perceived when I was standing there in the street, though I didn't know it. Um, the picture, in the end, was much more than the thing in the picture. Uh, and yet, I could never have anticipated that it would be so. And yet, I can't help believing that I went to Berlin in order to get this picture, uh, or one very much like it, and that what I wanted was exactly what I got. So I'll stop there. And uh, Andrew, we can turn on the light. And um, I only have a cell phone, you know, <laughs> <laughs> as far as digital goes. Um, but uh, the um, uh, so I, in photographing, I still work with film, but the film is scanned; it's digitally scanned, and uh, you know, then runs through Photoshop and is then inkjet printed. And so the prints, most of the prints you see in the other room, are are inkjet prints that are made that way. Um, and, you know, the next obvious question is, you know, well, is Photoshop, which of course is the center of that process, uh, very important to me? And yeah, the answer is it's hugely important. Um, and, it, you know, it's really transformed photography. But not in the way that people think, which is, you know, that you put a human head on a horse or whatever. It's, you know, it's not, you know, it's only as crude as you, as you are. <laughs> it's, uh, um, No, I don't think I don't think anything's lost. I, I think Photoshop's fantastic, and what it allows you to do is it allows you a, a degree of, of control over what you over the emphasis of every small thing in your pictures that you know that allows you to literally change their meanings, right? So, you know, for example, um, you know. If you've been, a, you've worked in a dark room before, right? So you know what dodging and burning are. I hope most of you know that. It's essentially, you know, if you're you're projecting light in conventional process from an enlarger through a transparency onto a sheet of paper, you put your hand in between to you know cover up parts of it to interrupt the light and make them lighter or darker. But it's very crude because your hand is big, you know. And even if you're uh, uh, you know, if you're very fancy and you cut out little pieces of paper and put them on the end of a wire and wiggle them around in there, it's still extremely crude. You know, Photoshop allows you to do this with extraordinary precision. So it means that you're looking at the face of somebody, right? And all of a sudden you realize that what's really important about that person is, you know, the way the light is, you know, reflecting on the surface of the left eye rather than on the right eye. And now you can speak about that, thanks to Photoshop, which you could never do before. Um, so it, it gives you a, a tremendous degree of control uh, that you never had, of real expressive control that you never had before. And it makes you a much more, you know, what, you know, sophisticated, potentially, uh, interpreter of the thing you're looking at. Two quick questions of curiosity. Yeah. When you go to one of these cities, yeah. do you have a set amount of time that you're going to designate, or you go in there because you're looking for that one particular shot and then you're gone? And then the second question is when you're dealing with groups of people, are they posed? Do they, do they know they're being photographed? Um, or you're looking for a purely natural shot. Right. So, question one um, usually I go for a fixed amount of time just for practical reasons, you know, so I'll. You know, I'm going to be. I'm going to spend this week in Dakar, and then I'm going to leave Dakar and go home, or go somewhere else, or or whatever. I I very often go to the same places over and over again. So although you go through a set of pictures like this, and you'll think, oh my God, this guy, you know, <laughs> the guy the guy was in one, one city for every picture, you know, or took one picture out of every city. No, you know, I mean, I photographed in you know London 
25 times and I'll do it 45 times more before I'm, I'm done. And, you know, the same with almost any of the places that, that are really interesting. I'll go and go and go again, and very often I'll go to the same places in those cities. And, you know, I mean, with total perversity, you know. Um, the, the second question, um, you know, do you, do you pose people? Um, generally not. You know, once in a while, if there's somebody I'm absolutely in love with and they won't stand still and I'm brave enough, I'll, you know, stop them and say, would you please stand still? But, um, but in general, no. And in general, I don't really want to talk to anybody. And uh, I don't have conversations unless somebody grabs me and says, talk to me. Um, and why is that? Uh, because photographing for me is a lot like writing. It's a very inward, it's a, it's a condition in which you, you, you become intensely concentrated. And you're looking inward as much as you're looking outward. You're remembering a thousand things, things you've seen before, pictures you've seen before, things you've read before, movies you've seen, things that happened in your life, things people said to you. And you're connecting all of these things with each other and whatever, with whatever it is that you're looking at at the same time. And in fact, it's out of that outward, inward, outward, inward, you know, process that you work yourself into that the photograph comes to be what it is, which is a mirror and a window at the same time. You're looking at the world, but you're also, you know, you're also projecting yourself into the world. So you, I don't want to be interrupted, you know. I, I would prefer when I'm fortunate enough to really get going, I don't want anyone to bother me, even if I'm in the middle of a big crowd. So. Yeah. You, in your discussion, you uh, talked about uh, about the contents of the image, both in terms of what it communicates and what it maybe fails to communicate, mm -hmm. and what you know about it and what you mm -hmm. don't know about it. So it's all, it all seems to be communication and content based. I'm wondering to what to what extent does the the conventional concepts of aesthetics, uh, aesthetics of composition, what what role do they play in, in uh, kinds of pictures? That you know, I, I'm not sure what you mean by conventional because, um, you know, I, I mean, I know. I mean, simple things like, like you know, two thirds. Kind yeah, of you know, like the Vitruvian man and so on. But, you know. Horizon line is. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm much more, um, what would you call it, utilitarian than that. Um, whatever seems to me like it's going to most effectively, powerfully speak for the thing that's in front of me is what I'll do. And, you know, inevitably that means that most of the time it's not going to work. But that's okay, too. Um, you use the word beautiful. Hmm? I'm trying to understand. When you said beautiful, what do you mean? <laughs> I mean something that makes you, I, 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 I know, I use it in a very slippery way, okay? So there's conventionally beautiful, right? You know, the land, oh, look what a beautiful landscape, look what a beautiful woman, look what beautiful light, blah, 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 blah. And I'll use it that way, I, I admit I used it that way, speaking here. Uh, but what do I also mean? I mean, what do I mean profoundly? Something that helps you live through another day, you know? Um, seriously. Because I think that, you know, truly, uh, you know, good art, real art, uh, which has nothing to do with the art world, or has something to do with the art world, but a limited amount to do with the art world, has a very practical function um, in the life, the lives of people who make it and the lives of people who live very close to it and use it and consume it in great doses the way I do, uh, which is that it it makes life which would otherwise, on some level, you know, seem intolerably tawdry or intolerably boring or intolerably something, uh, makes it not that way. I mean, it, it, it's redeeming, genuinely. And the redemption, if you're any kind of an artist, the redemption is what people buy the ticket for. They don't buy it for anything else. You're not telling them about the world, telling them anything they don't know about the world already or that they can't read in a thousand books. There's a whole library of books on globalization. I can't contribute one useful thing to that. All I can do is read those books along with everyone else. But I can make you, maybe, 
if I do a good picture, feel a certain way about all of that, which you wouldn't have felt before. And that's what the picture's for. I, I don't know if that answers your question, but or answers 10 other questions <laughs> instead. Yeah. Is it typical for you to frame in the camera pretty much exactly the scene that you want? As closely as I can. As closely as I can, but I'm a great believer in something that uh, there, there's a, a very wonderful uh, Japanese photographer called Shomei Tomatsu, and uh, he used to speak of something that he called camera fate, as one word, right? And I, I'm a real believer in that, by which I mean that a camera sees much more than you can see, right? And unless you're working very, very slowly like Ansel Adams and standing it up on your tripod and taking half an hour to do it, there's no chance that you're going to see most of what's falling into your frame. You're going to see some. And some of what you see, and, and there are many things that you will see that you're not even aware of seeing, you know? In fact, a lot of what ends up in the picture you can't account for, okay? The camera can account for it, though, of course, it's a dumb machine. Maybe you can figure out how to account for it by saying, well, I was aware of it unconsciously, blah, 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 you know, if you believe that. I kind of do, you know. One way or another, you know, you're improvising constantly in relation to the world. You know, um, I'll give you an example. Um, there's that horrible song. Uh, in um, The Sound of Music, you know, my favorite things, uh, what is it, roses and kittens and all that stuff, right? And uh, <laughs> you like that one, huh? And, and then there's the, uh, and the song, you know, is, can be written out in musical notes on a sheet of paper, right? And then there is a version of that song that was played by the saxophonist uh, John Coltrane. And he did a very interesting and maybe beautiful version of that song. Um, and two-thirds of what you hear in his version of it cannot be written down on a page of notes because it's all squeaks and burps and accidental sounds and buzzes and noises that come out of the, the saxophone and that he didn't know would be there until he made them. But they're exactly the expressive material of his version of of the song, and photography is a lot like that. A good photography is a lot like that. A lot of the worst photography arises from people attempting to over-control. And the worst of the worst arises out of over-controlling in order to be an artist with a capital A, or to be perceived as such. Yeah? Leo, thanks so much. It was really a pleasure to speak alongside the photographs. I think I have a question that's more about traveling than it is. Sure. <laughs> Where should I stay in Vladivostok? Uh, yeah. More, uh, I don't know, vague than that. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's a French proverb that really resonates with me that says something like, the importance of traveling is not having seen other lands or landscapes or places. It's having seen through other eyes. And so when you're talking about the world city, and um, I, see, I see a lot of similarities of, of faces uh, or expressions on different faces. So I, I just wanted to invite you to maybe make a comparison as to how that, that idea of traveling and seeing through other eyes compares to life in a world city with, with regards to your reference to globalization. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure I completely understand your, your question, to tell you the truth. Um, but uh, you know, there's no question that the more you, you know, stretch yourself, the more you understand about the place you came from, the more you understand about yourself, the more you understand about what you value. Um, the, the similarities among the, 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 the people in these pictures, I can't say much about that. I mean, that's, you know, they're my pictures. I, I, you know, they're not going to look all that different from each other, no matter how hard I try to make them. I, you know, I will actually try to stretch them and, and 
you know, make them more diverse next year than they were the year before. But you, you can't stop being yourself. You can stretch. I, I'm not answering your question well, but I, I'm not sure I understand the question. <laughs> yeah. You normally see poetically about traveling through this, what you call the global city, um, and capturing, as you say, sort of snapshots of this global city, as it were. Um, I just want to push you a little bit on that term, global city, and in fact, what I, I certainly think your photographs seem to document, which is the inherent uneas uh, unevenness of the global city. Um, there is certainly uh, a recurrence of images that um, seem to address the unevenness of what we would say sustains the global city, which is the global economy. Be that a kind of informal market stall in South Africa, or the arrival of global brands in the former Soviet Union. Um, and it interests me even more when you say that you, you didn't feel um, a great need to <coughs> desire in any way to photograph the events of 9-11, which certainly were uh, perhaps an attack on the United States, but were also attack at, an attack at the heart of what we understand as the global city, fueled by an uneven global mm -hmm. economy. So I know that you don't want to talk about maybe meaning or or for me to suggest that you are a there's any sort of political activism or anything about your work, but I just wondered if you could comment about this maybe even accidental documenting of unevenness within the global city. Yeah, well, yeah, I'll, try, I'll try to come to the unevenness part last, um, but don't let me forget to say something about it. Um, you know, uh, the, all, I should say, for those of you who, who haven't looked closely at the show in there, uh, this show um, is the first time that I, I, I'm a very slow worker. I, I take forever to finish anything. And, um, you know, really my whole life as a photographer has is, is pretty much boiled down to four large projects, each of which has taken many years. Um, of those, the largest and most ambitious, and God knows the, the one that's taken the longest, is this project called In the World City, which is one of the four that's in there. Um, everything I showed you just now is from that project. I, I didn't cover the other projects just now, only that one. Now, I began working on that project in, I began working on it, you know, with awareness of it in the 1990s. And it happened as a, a, you know, dumb accident that I bought an apartment about two and a half blocks away from the World Trade Center and moved into it one week before the World Trade Center was destroyed. Um, and so I was caught up in the middle of the events of that day. And one thing that I remember very clearly uh, feeling, even as I was standing there on my apartment roof, um, watching the, the towers burning and, and, you know, feeling devastated by what had happened. I mean, it was a horrible, utterly traumatic event. But even in the middle of that, I was very selfishly regretting the fact that I thought all this work I had done on this project, World City, would need to be abandoned. And why would it, and, you know, here I'd spent all these years on it, I was have to throw it away and do nothing with it. Why? Because it seemed to me, you know, in the face of this event of September 11th, it seemed pathetically innocent, ignorant, you know, willfully ignorant, I mean worse. Uh, it seemed like I had no idea what this transnational space or whatever it was that interested me was really about. Um, because I had been all the way through the 90s a, a kind of a you know, Clintonian optimist, and I believe that the more connection there was in the world, the better it would be for everybody, and, you know, wasn't life wonderful, and so forth. And uh, all of a sudden that was shattered, you know, instantly shattered. So even in that first 45 minutes before the towers fell, I was not only mourning everything that was in front of me, I was mourning my own lost project, you know. Um, I went on to do the book, wounded cities. And through that came the long way back around to where I thought I could actually complete the World City book, which I've now picked back up, resumed, and which is now the main project in my life. Um, I would disagree with you that unevenness is uh, the direct cause 
of what we experienced on September 11th. I think that the causes are far more complicated than that. And I try to talk about that some in the text for Wounded Cities. It's a book that has a big text as well as the pictures. Um, but I would say that my own view of the so-called world city became much darker as a result of that experience and as a result of learning everything I learned in the years of doing Wounded Cities. And I've tried to bring that into the pictures latterly. And I, I hope to bring it in even more until there's a lot of darkness in there. Um, yeah? How many photos do you have to take to get a good one? Too many. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes? Do you interact with your subjects closely using a standard lens, or do you separate yourself? You no, know, I'm very close. I'm, I'm just as close as it looks. Um, you know, it's, I'm, I'm, about this far away, as far as I am from uh, Sandy, the lady in the red coat here right now. So it's not far. It's very close. You know, unless it, you're looking out at a city or something that's vast and, and far away. Yeah? I'm just curious, why did you decide to uh, present your photographs to us through photographs and photographs in frames with edges around the frame? I, you mean here in the gallery? Uh, the way that you just presented it to us on the slideshow. Usually we just get something that looks more like a photograph, whereas now we got a photograph inside a frame. Oh, you mean the white around yeah. the margin? They're not 35 millimeter photographs. They're, they're six by seven centimeter photographs, all the ones I showed you here. So they're a different proportion than the, the slide itself. So something's going to be cut off. I mean, even if you fill it out top to bottom, you're gonna, the, you'll still have white on the left and right sides. Uh, you have to, or I suppose you could mask it off and have black, but I'd rather have white than black, <laughs> you know? I mean, that's, that's all it is. It's no more meaningful than that. Um, yeah? You were talking about the process of taking photographs and what was going through your mind. Yeah, yeah. Um, I wonder about that process the writing process and how you see the two of them and whether you enjoy one more than the other. Well, whether, sorry? You enjoy one more than the other one doing. You know, um, it's two different questions. The, the, I'll, I'll do the second, one, the second question first, enjoy. Uh, you know, there are people, I, I, I have some good friends who are photographers who say, I love to photograph. I never feel any better in my life than when I'm out there with a the camera, you know, photographing. It's never been that easy for me. Uh, and neither has writing. It's hard. Uh, it's hard. I mean, you're demanding immense concentration of yourself. You're demanding, you know, a real kind of emotional responsiveness of yourself over a, a long period of time, you know, it, it's not easy to do. There are moments when, um, there are moments when you forget yourself and you get carried away, you know, and you really do kind of fly away in the writing or in the photographing. And it, that's very thrilling. It's, a, it's an exciting feeling. It's a great feeling. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you get a good picture out of it. You know, you could feel that way all day and get nothing but bad pictures, you know. And you could feel absolutely terrible and get the best picture of the month, you know, and, and be sure that you were failing and get the best picture of the, the month. So I don't think it's so simple as enjoying yourself. Um, there are people who will say, uh, you know, I just had this discussion in New York last week uh, with a, an eminent commercial photographer uh, called Jay Maisel. And we were talking about a very eminent and celebrated photographer called Gary Winogrand. And Jay said to me, why do you photograph, you know? Uh, and I said, to get a good picture, you know? <laughs> and he said, well, you're wrong. That's the wrong reason to photograph. And I said, really? And he said, Gary wasn't like that, Winogrand wasn't like that. Winogrand photographed because he loved shooting. 
That was it. Shooting was enough for him. Now, you know, number one, I don't know if I believe him, right? <laughs> number two, whether I believe him or not, he certainly made me feel lousy. <laughs> uh, and number three, I don't believe him. Because if it's only the shooting, why well, put film in the camera? You know, for God's sake, you are doing it to get a picture. You know, I enjoy having a good picture very much. And so I do it to get another, you know. I mean, that's the answer. Um, what was the other piece of the question you asked? Oh, writing and photographing. You know, they, um, they're two completely different media. Uh, photographs can describe certain things that writing cannot describe. And writing can describe many, many, many things that photographs cannot describe. Why do both? Because I can. Um, most photographers can't. But some can. And there actually is a little, you know, tiny tradition within photography of, of photographers who write. And there have been some very beautiful writers among photographers. Um, why not simply say, OK, the pictures are enough for me. Um, I won't write, because I'm greedy. I mean, really, you know, because I want both. Um, but there's never a moment when I don't feel that by doing one, I'm cheating the other, you know. It's sort of like having two girlfriends. It's, you, you, can't feel, um, you can't feel that you're serving either one well enough as long as you're doing the other. So the result is I run twice as fast and, and desperately, you know, try to get enough done. Um, yeah? Your pictures make it appear that most of your subjects are not affected while you're taking the picture. And yet you said you're four or five feet away. How do you bring that off without, you know, causing people to to react in some way? I think many of them do, actually. I think if you go back, if you went back through this, you would see that lots of them are looking at the camera. And in the, the Wounded Cities book, many, many are looking at the camera. So no, I, I don't think it's true that, I, I think some are not looking and some are looking. Um, yeah? Just to follow up on that question, do you end up interacting with your subject? As little as possible, as I was saying before. I, I really. I'd prefer not to, but I'm not rude to people. I mean, if somebody, you know, wants to have a conversation, I'll have it and I'll try to make it as brief as I can, but I'll have it. Mm -hmm. You seem to know a lot about Photoshop. How much you take advantage of it, like change perspective, merging pictures? Uh, none, of, none, none, none. Uh, maybe a, a tiny amount of perspective change. There's a function called transform skew, and I'll use that a very little bit, but, uh, Merging things never. I, I've never done that. I, I don't really know how to do that, actually. When you went on, one question, would you ever think of doing text for somebody else's photos, or doing photos for somebody else's text, or do you have to be self-contained to really visualize the picture? Well, you know, there, there are different kinds of books, OK, that are done. Um, and one thing that I do very occasionally, as sort of, you know, 50% day job, 50% labor of love is I will do a, a curatorial project and when I do that obviously I'm writing about somebody else's work but that's not the same it's a different kind of writing from the writing that I'll do you know in my own books which is uh, you know much more a, a sort of memoir writing and you know rather elegiac in character and extremely personal and you know, full of, you know, all sorts of speculations and so forth. You know, I'm, I, I, I behave when I'm writing about somebody else. And, and so it's more formal and it's, it's more proper. And, uh, and I will do that when I feel that I have enough of a reason, enough to say about somebody else's work. I'll do it. And when I want to say that thing. I have a lot of things to say I don't want to say, but if, uh, you know, there's something worth saying, yeah. Yes? My experience of photographing strangers candidly or even 
beyond the stranger is sometimes they don't really care for that. And sometimes there's a sense of you're taking something from them that belongs to them. Mm -hmm. um, do you have that experience? So, so, so I, you know, there was a great uh, moment I was told about. Uh, again, this relates to Winogrand. Uh, somebody told me this last week. I think it might have been Maisel who said there was this time Gary was photographing uh, somebody, and the person said, uh, uh, "What are you going to do with my picture?" Right? <laughs> and he said, "It's not your picture. It's my picture." <laughs> you know. And I think, uh, this sounds silly, but it's very profound. Who owns what you see? What did you see? The person in the picture? The way the light fell on that person's face? The movement of things behind that person? The way the person is contained in the space within the picture where the frame lands around the picture? I mean, there are a lot of things in that picture besides the person in the picture. And who own owns them? Not the person in the picture, but the person who saw it, you. Now. In practical terms, what happens? Do people get angry? Sometimes. Very often? Not that often. Most people are rather flattered to have attention paid to them, I think. Um, once in a while, somebody gets very angry, and it's always very unpleasant when that happens. Um, and, uh, you know, you get through it as best you can, and fortunately, it doesn't happen that much. And if there's a, there are places where it happens a lot, you probably don't go back to those places. Uh, you know, I think last one. Yeah. Now, one of the games my students like to play is insider, outsider, and we'll look at Don Golden's photos of the insider, and we'll look at Heinz outsider or Robert Frank outsider. Do those terms resonate with you? Uh, if they do, no, I don't. I don't know what they mean. What What do they mean? When you're in Tokyo as a child, are you taking photos as one of the part of the community that you're part of when you're in New York? Are you more or less in that community? I'm never part of anything much, you know. I'm, I really, it's, uh, first of all, you know, there's no foreigner who can, can go, you know, even to live a lifetime in Japan and claim to have been accepted by that, you know, enormously self-isolating and, you know, self-conscious country. So, you know, you, you could only be, you know, lying to yourself if you, you said you were. But no, I think that, you know, for me, I, I mean, there are, you know, there are photographers who feel part of, maybe, you know, the world that they're in. But no, I, I don't. No. So maybe, I, maybe the answer is I'm an outsider. But there's a hell of a lot of, you know, longing, I think, to be an insider in the pictures, frustrated longing <laughs> to be, you know, connected with all of that stuff that's in the pictures and to own it more, to possess it, or to be possessed by it more than I think I can. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you everybody for coming. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.